We're going to get started. We're going to be in Genesis 6 and 7 this morning. We are going to wrap up some thoughts from Genesis 7 that we talked about last time. And then maybe if we have time, go back to Genesis 6 just a little bit. Because last week we were supposed to cover Genesis 6, and we really spent more time in Genesis 7. So this week we're supposed to cover Genesis 7, so I figure it's alright if we spend a little bit of time in Genesis 6. You're talking fast. I'm sorry, what's that? You're talking fast. I said just keep talking fast. You know, I'm not stressed about it. We'll just get through what we get through, and it'll be alright. So I'm not so worried about it. But, uh, yes, Genesis chapter 7 this morning, talking about Noah. Uh, he is preparing for the flood, he is building an ark, and God is sending animals to him to get on the ark, and that's, we spent a good deal of time last time talking about um, how in, in Genesis 6, it tells us that uh, the, uh, God told him to put uh, two of every, you know, two by two into the ark, um, which, uh, two, two, two males, two females of, of each animal, but then in Genesis chapter 7, uh, God cl- kind of clarifies there, and he says it's two of every animal at least, but really you're looking at uh, seven of the clean ones. And so I, I want to just kind of uh, expand on that just a little bit um, from last week. I think we covered it pretty well, but just a couple of extra thoughts for you. So when it says, we're in Genesis chapter 7 and verse 2, it says, You shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and his female, two each of animals that are unclean, a male and his female, uh, and also each of the birds of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive on the face of the earth. And so when it says you shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, if you think about it, that you don't, it says a male and his female, but you don't really, that seven doesn't come to an even number, right? Because you have four males and three females, or vice versa, three, four females and three males. And what it literally says is seven and seven. And so the idea is uh, 14 total, you've got seven males and seven females. And when you think about, you know, why would there be more clean animals, um, there are really, they would use the animals for several different things if they were clean, and so you wouldn't need more of them. First of all, you need a male and a female, at least one, for breeding purposes, because they, they want to continue the race or the, the kind of creature that they have. And uh, Sarah, who knows a lot more about agriculture, was reminding me that um, animals that live long, males especially that live long enough to breed and that have that full surge of testosterone that they get as they get older are tougher meats, more like beef jerky, and so uh, or some kind of jerky. And so uh, they're they're not for some people they're not as desirable to eat. And you see that in the Bible, for example, in First Samuel chapter twenty-eight and verse twenty-four. First uh, Samuel chapter twenty-eight and verse twenty-four, he talks about getting the fatted calf. And that's also in the prodigal son. You know, they ate the fatted calf. This is a young animal that hasn't had all that testosterone. So it's a it's a softer kind of meat. And that's even today, a lot of people prefer to eat when it's about a year old or something like that, you know. And so um, so you need a male for breeding, but you're maybe not so interested in eating that one unless you're going to make jerky. So then you need a second male for, for eating because they, uh, they ate these clean animals and they couldn't eat just any animal. They had to eat the clean ones. So they needed extras of these because they needed one for eating. And then you also need at least one male for sacrificing because that's what we talked about last time. And at the end of chapter 8 and verse 20, Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Well, the truth is you can't eat an animal that you're going to sacrifice. It's not, it's not allowed. Uh, well, well, you might eat some of it afterwards, but not before. And you can't breed it either. It says, uh, for example, Numbers chapter 19 and verses 2 through 10. In Numbers 19 through 2, 10, it says that when you're going to sacrifice a goat or a bull, that no yoke can ever be placed on it. In other words, you've never used it for anything. You've not bred with it. You've not, well, obviously you haven't eaten it yet. You've not worked it any. This is the first fruits. The idea of the first fruits, you've taken the best one and you've never used it for anything. You've set it aside for God. And so therefore it can't be that you bred it and then sacrifice it to God using the same bull. You need a third distinct, at least one animal that's clean just for that purpose. And so you think you need at least one, you know, when they got off the ark, they need at least one that they're going to eat on and if it's a big, clean animal, they might could eat on it for a year or so, and then eat the descendants of the other ones. Just <coughs> one, uh, one to eat on, 
at least one, maybe two to three to breed. And so that's, if you have one that you're sacrificing that's never bred, then while it says male and female, some of those females are going with, you know, and that's bulls and, and you, you need one male and then several females as a herd, you know, and so they're really kind of going with a different male. And then you need at least maybe two to three for sacrificing, you know, uh, the sacrifice in Acts, er, Acts, Genesis 8, but then also, you know, they might need to make other sacrifices after after Noah uh, has his his episode after he grew the grapes and then his son had his episode where he saw him in the tent. Maybe they needed to make a sacrifice for sin after that, you know, and so they might need more than one. So you get seven, one for eating that first year, maybe two or three to breed and two or three to sacrifice, you know, and it could be different numberings, but something kind of like that. Miss Peggy. Mm, uh, I can't give you a, a complete list because I don't remember it all, but, you know, uh, goats are clean, and that's, um, there's a, uh, I want to say that it's in Exodus 24 and verse 5, I wrote down the young bulls there, but I think in that same passage it says kids, you know, the, the kid is what you sacrifice, not a mature goat. Um, goats are clean, bulls are clean, um, uh, doves and pigeons are clean. Um, can anyone think of? There are other ones, but I can't remember. Well, the hooves had something to do with it. Yeah, there was. Did you could or not? You know. So. Yes, there's, there's in in Exodus or Leviticus. It's probably in Leviticus. He goes through all of the specifications on which ones and and why uh, some of them are clean and some of them are not. But there are some of them, and that's you know, uh, is it the split hooves? They can't. They right. can't eat. You know, like pigs have split hooves. I'm Club, sorry. Cloven hooves is what they call it. Or split, same thing. Oh, okay. Uh, well, at any rate, I, I'm getting out of my depth apparently, but uh, um, <laughs> pigs, whatever kind of hoof that is, they, they didn't eat those. They were not considered safe to eat, or God said don't eat them. But today we know that if you don't have like good refrigeration processes, <laughs> pigs spoil very quickly. And so we can look at it scientifically today and say, well, they didn't eat pigs because God knew that they'd get sick all the time. They maybe didn't know all of that. God just said don't. But, you know, uh, cattle, oxen, I think oxen, I think are clean. Some of those other animals, it's easier to keep them clean, or clean, yeah, clean. It's easier to keep them uh, good for longer, and they would they would salt the meat to make it last longer. And they did have some kinds of refrigeration, preservation practices, but pigs didn't do as well back then. So, uh, so yeah, that is maybe just a little bit of more clarification. Um, yes, ma'am. That's why in Ecuador and Peru they eat guinea pigs. Okay. Sure, yeah. They just go in there at the river this time. They had them down in the kitchen floor. They were running around everywhere. You could just pick your little guinea pig. There you go. Just <laughs> pick the one you think looks the best. Not me. Not you. Okay. <laughs> pick the fat one. And, well, yeah. You pick your own steak. But yeah. Different. You pick your lobster, red lobster. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this one, you know, he sleeps with you at night. And then, yeah. So. So, uh, yeah, but that's true. If you look at some countries today that have, um, you know, less less economic uh, security than we do, oftentimes you find that they have very similar practices to what's described here because their situation is more like ancient times. And so you can, you can really see sometimes the reasons or the evidence that what they were doing made a lot of sense. And maybe they didn't understand it fully, but, it, you know, we can see it more clearly today. And that just really kind of helps confirm what we're reading for us. So, all right, that is um, uh, that. Any other comments or thoughts on the sevens, the seven animal, the 14 animals, the two animals, anything like that? All right, so now let's go back to Genesis chapter six and we will um, finish that. <clears throat> First of all, uh, it talks about in chapter six and verse four, it says that there were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward, when uh, the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them, and those were the mighty men who were old, men of renown. And so uh, the question that some you might get sometime, you might be talking to somebody at some point, and they might ask the question, could have there ever actually been giants? You know, I mean, that, that sounds kind of like a fairy tale, uh, dragons and giants and unicorns. And so could, have there ever actually been giants, or is this just kind of a a contradiction that the Bible has from reality. And so if somebody asks you that question, maybe what, what's something that you might say to kind of help them see that this really is uh, scientifically very accurate 
description here in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 4? David one. Okay, so you know we have the example of Goliath, and, and his that's, brother. <laughs> I'm sorry. And his brother. And there were actually uh, you know dozens of them mentioned right. that they killed in that time period, as well as during Moses's time period. Oh, land. Yes. The whole land has all of that. Yes, that's during Moses when they went to the farthest north part on the on the other side of the Jordan River, the east side. That was a whole land of of giants. Yes, they even mentioned that in Genesis 19 with Sodom and Gomorrah. But yeah, Goliath himself, if you, if they, you know, it says he was so many cubits, and a cubit is just a standard of measurement that we don't know exactly how much it is, but guessing if it's about 18 inches, he was at least nine foot and nine inches tall. And so this is an example, but uh, of, of other giants later in history. So it's not so hard to believe that they existed earlier in history. I think some archeology has found that yes. skeletal nine inches tall. Yes, and so that's, you know, that's um, another important part to know because if someone doesn't believe Genesis 6, they may not be convinced if you point to a different Bible passage, you know, because their, their doubt is with the Bible. And so for us, it's like, oh, that makes perfect sense. But if they doubt the Bible in the first place, then they may not be convinced by just saying, well, David killed one. But if you can point to other sources that, uh, that they might consider, and if they did this in the Bible too, you know, in Acts 17, uh, Paul quotes the Bible, you know, quotes the Old Testament, but he also quotes their own poets. And because that's sources that they're familiar with and sources that they trust. And so he takes what's true out of their poets. And um, where is it? Is it in uh, uh, Titus, I think, that he quote, he says, uh, what the Cretan poets say is true. All Cretans are, are liars and um, uh, something else. But, you know, he, he quotes, he finds something true within their own poetry and he quotes it because that's something that they can identify with. And so if you can find something that the person you're talking to already trust and show them how what the Bible says compares to that is also true, then you can help build their confidence in the Bible. And so for example, um, Miss Linda was saying that archeology span has found giants, uh, bones of very giant people. Um, that, that is true. Uh, even, even people who believe very strongly in evolution uh, will quote what they call um, a, a strain of people called Homo Heidelbergensis, which sounds like a disease, but I think they must have found them in Germany where Heidelberg is, I assume. I assume that's true. And so this, this, uh, this group of people, most of them were more than seven feet tall. <coughs> Not all of them, but most of them were more than seven feet tall. And even today, there is a sultan in the Middle East somewhere um, who is the Guinness Book of World Records tallest man on record since, since Guinness has been tracking things. This sultan, who has some kind of pituitary problem that caused an overprotection of his growth hormone, grew to be eight feet three inches. So, you know, if, if we can have pituitary problems today, they could have them back then. And, uh, and then the tallest man in history uh, that, that ever lived, uh, he was eight feet and 11 inches, well, that ever lived on record. He was eight feet and 11 inches and he weighed 491 pounds. And so, you know, he's almost a nine foot tall man. So the idea that the Bible records Goliath being almost 10 feet tall really matches in line with that pretty well. And the idea that even before the flood, there could have been some very large men who ruled the world at that time is really not that strange. Um, before Kenny, I saw, yes, Mr. David. Well, you know, when they went over into the promised land, they said there's a giant. Yes. Well, the promised land was very lucrative. I mean, as far as yeah. things to eat and what have you. Sure. You can go here in the United States and you can go around in, in New Mexico or Arizona and go to some of those ancient sites and they were really tiny people because they didn't have a lot to eat. Enough to eat. You can go also on American Indians, those that were around the coast of uh, the Gulf of Mexico were really tall because they had all the food. They had plenty. Yeah. And you went on inside. They're not as big. Well, but it's amazing that, you know, the promised land, of course, it produced giants because it has so much food. Stuff and that, that's a really good point from, from two different perspectives. First of all, uh, it would make sense that the biggest people would control the greatest land. And so if it has all that plenty, it makes sense that the biggest people, until God gets involved, that they would have won that. Second of all, that really is true. You can look at different generations of people, and you can have a very tall man. And he has a very short son who has a very tall son himself. And then you look at when did they live? Well, if they lived during the Great Depression, you know, your genetics identifies how tall you are, but also your nutrients and environment also plays into that. And so 
and now not not always you know sometimes you have exceptions but generally speaking people who are, are very tall both have the genetics and the resources to grow to that height and and you know i guess what they say is true you know if you drink too much coffee when you're a kid it'll stunt your growth and i don't know about coffee but but you know that that you can eat things or have not enough to eat in order to grow to the fullest potential that you could have don't tell my dad he always wanted to be six foot and he's uh five uh nine and three quarters and so i'm sorry five eleven and three quarters so he almost made it but yeah, he just needed to eat more i guess so um i thought i saw another yes sarah well, i just you know you can't just watch you know professional basketball and it like that's a whole group of men that are all very very Six, tall seven, and you watch like yeah. a, a you know like an average height person stand next to them and it just feel very giant and so it's really not that much of a stretch a stretch most of them are like seven foot or taller mm -hmm. that in the past there could be people who are just a couple feet taller than that yes really not especially whenever you look at the way that generation shifts and like people from england used to average five feet tall mm -hmm. and now a lot of us are descended from those people and five foot is below average for both men and women right so, and so you think about generational factors and and just the way that we see different cultures produce taller people like the maasai in africa mm -hmm. they're all over seven feet tall on average most of the yeah. women are like six six so she's saying that uh um you just look at different cultures and you can see this as well there's the the tribe of the maasai in africa and they're all over seven or more feet tall you look at north and south korea and the men in which one is it north, north korea are extremely tall people but the no the other way around, the other way around. i'm just switching things all around are extremely short people and the men in south korea are extremely tall people well they have a common you know lineage you know they they come from a similar group but something about their environment uh and their genetics created that disparity and so you can see that in the culture that are the one that she used in particular was just look at basketball courts and you see um you know they look so tiny on the screen until you see them stand next to like me or someone of more average height and then suddenly you're like that guy is huge you know and and they're really not this they're really not this big y'all they're they're like seven or more foot tall so kenny well uh, the spies that went in the canyon came back and reported that they were like grasshoppers to them yes so there's a definite difference that they saw there yeah and also bible scholars have said that many skeletons in the united states have been found that were extremely tall the native american people or large yeah. people yeah and they said it's not tradition to us the scientists you know doesn't fit their theory that they want to promote of people so having been this up yeah that there are actually some pretty large skeletons a whole graveyard or full of them over in louisiana that were up now there you go yeah tall. right here our next door neighbors have, have proof of what we're talking about in louisiana so and that is true you know uh, evolutionists and scientists try to talk about like the progression of people over time or progression of things over time and the truth is when you look at any generation you have such variation that there's no reason to think that we were all very short or all very tall in the past they were just different sizes like we are today. Yeah. Uh, Philip? I think sometimes short men like me, and I'm five foot six, that we can get a complex about it. There's a thing called little man syndrome yeah. where yeah. because of our lack of height, we can easily feel that we've got to be overly aggressive. Uh -huh. um, and that is not, you know, that should not be the case. Uh, we don't have to feel bad about being short. Uh, Sarah brought up professional basketball. There was a player in the NBA years ago named Spud Webb who was five foot seven, an inch taller than and he was he was very good. This yeah. is in a game dominated by men who are seven feet taller for yeah. do it. Yeah, and so I think that, you know, it's this is certainly not God giving preference to tall or short people. In fact, these these people are really ultimately the people who are destroyed in the flood. So you know it's not a preference any by any means. Uh, Miss Tammy? There was a black guy that uh, played basketball at SFA. His name is Ken Beasley. And I was in line for lunch one time and he was behind me and I turned around. I was looking at his knees. Oh. <laughs> and, and I'm like, 
<laughs> I'm really looking fun. up at him, and he looks down at me, and he goes, hi. <laughs> <laughs> you felt like a kid again. Yeah. You felt like a kid again. That's, um, and then, you know, when we talk about giants, sometimes people think, like, Jack and the Beanstalk. And so they're picturing, like, 40-foot-tall people with, you know, like, legs the size of a of those big trees in California, you know? And that's, it's, it's not... It's not ridiculous like that. Giants, you know, if you stood next to that man, you would feel like he was a giant in comparison to you. And when they say that they felt like grasshoppers, we're not being literal. Right? He says, like grasshoppers. That's, you know, a grasshopper is, is you know, this big and a man is, is this big. In comparison, that's how they felt. But it wasn't actually that big of a difference. The, those people were probably seven, eight, nine, ten foot or so tall. And if you stand next to a 10-foot man, I promise you'll feel like a grasshopper. And so that's that's all we're talking about here. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I think my point is, is that those of us who are physically diminutive, so to speak, we don't need to feel like that we can't do things just because we're not physically imposed. Right. You stop and think about what a tiny black with a spider can do to a 300-pound yeah. man. He can kill him. Yeah, yeah. Something way bigger than him. Mm-hmm. And so, go to the uh, anti sluggers. So, yeah. pe- people my height love the old saying, my cousin's fall past me. Joshua and Caleb didn't have the problem. No, they were not tall men, but they did not have any problem. And so, uh, um, some of the great that's very true. Heroes were little, bad. little bitty guys, that's right. Yeah. Look at Audie Murphy, he's a little bitty guy. <laughs> a little bitty guy. And that, yeah. And that's really in Genesis 6, you don't, you don't get the sense that, and that's, you know, you look at um, when God sent Samuel in 1 Samuel 16 to anoint David king over Israel. And and uh, Samuel is thinking that it's going to be Eliashib, the, old, the oldest son. And so, you know, he says he looks tall and like a king. He looks like a king because he's very tall, very masculine. He looks like he could lead people into battle. And so he must be the one. And God says, you're looking at the physical stature. I'm looking at the heart. David was a short little man. He didn't look like a king. He didn't look like a hero, certainly not a war hero. Uh, but he says, you know, I, uh, I've i just been keeping sheep and I take down bears and lions with my bare hands because God protects me. And so I can I can defeat Goliath if I have to, you know, and and uh, even though he's just a, uh, like Zacchaeus, a wee little man, uh, Zacchaeus is another example, someone who was who became righteous and good, height has nothing to do with it. So that's a, that's a good point. Any other thoughts or comments on that, Kenny? If you want to see examples of what genetics can do, nutrition is great. Just look at the cattle industry. Johnny can tell you. Sure. There's cattle out there. Their backs be nearly as high as those windows uh-huh. that they were walking on the floor. I think we saw one down there too. All you have to do is, it, and you can take them from smaller animals. But yeah. Crossing genetics. Working them, the breeding them to certain. And yeah. Feeding them in certain ways, they can be gigantic. Yeah. I've been up close to some of them. I just could not believe how big they were. Well, and you've seen that in people too. Like sometimes you've seen two very short people, and you know they have a history of being short people. But there's something about the recessive gene or something, and they have like a seven foot tall son, and you're like, how, how is that even possible? You know, but it, it's it's very possible. It's very possible. So we don't have long. I want to end in Genesis six with one more thing that uh, we'll try to just run through very briefly. And that is, uh, while we're dealing with things in Genesis 6, to talk for just a moment, what if someone asked you, or, or you know, maybe you're just thinking to yourself, about what it says, it uh, starts in Genesis 6, 1, it says, It came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, uh, that daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men, or saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And so uh, there's, there's a theory that I've even heard, you know, some people in the Church of Christ teach about how this is uh, uh, fallen angels who are who are uh, marrying women, human women, and creating these giants, this sort of like race of superhumans, half angel, half half human people, and uh, and that these uh, these people are the people who are described in verse four, and that um, you know. The, there's this this kind of like that's what created this wicked scenario that that led to the flood was fallen angels corrupting humanity and so I want to just very briefly consider what he's talking about here by pointing out uh, basically three things first of all as always it's very important to keep these things in context who are we talking about in Genesis 4 especially if you start in verse 16 verses 16 to 24 what are we talking about there? 
Yeah, the line of Cain, right? A family, a family of people. We don't, yeah. A family of people who ultimately have, you know, Cain killed his brother. Then you get to the end of the line where you have Lamech. Lamech kills a man. You have the people who are, are murderers, right? They're, they're not repentant people. They're people who are choosing not to follow God. You get into verse uh, 26. It says, as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. And we looked a while back at what that means, about how that means that in time of trouble, you're turning to God first and to only God. So you have then his genealogy, Seth from Adam uh, through Seth down to Noah. You have basically uh, Cain's family line, which are made up of examples of evil people, and then Seth's family line, which are made up of people who are said, generally speaking, called on the name of the Lord. And then the very next verse, chapter 6, has in verses 1 and 2 have a sentence that says that the sons of God marry the daughters of men. Now, if you were if you knew nothing about that theory about angels and you were just reading in context, chapter 4 has a line of evil people, chapter 5 has a line of righteous people, and then chapter 6 opens and says that the sons of God married the daughters of men. What maybe would you just assume we're talking about here? Evil and again, good group and evil group mixed. Yeah, right. <laughs> Seth's sons begin to marry Cain's daughters, which, if you think about the context of the writing, Moses is writing it to the Israelites as they wandered in the wilderness. What is the greatest problem that Israel faced throughout the, all of their time? Solomon struggled with it. Even to the time of Nehemiah, he's asking men to separate from the wives of people who won't convert to, this, to Judaism, uh, to, to true Old Testament worship. And, uh, and who persist in their pagan idols, right? And they continue to worship pagans. And so Moses are, is writing this, and he's saying, Seth was a righteous man who had a righteous family until they began to marry Cain's daughters. And Cain's daughters were not righteous people. They led them astray. And so the result is for, it, right after it, in verse 3, the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his day shall be 120 years. It got so bad that God said, 120 more years, and then I end it all. And if it weren't for Noah, there would be no more people. Noah is the only standout, him and his family. And so uh, when it follows and says in verse 4, there were giants on the earth. This is not some kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, these angels, angel-human breed mixture created, you know, magical people that are big. And that would take away from the whole point, wouldn't it? From the beginning, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, the, uh, the, the snake tempted them. But who fell? Humanity did. It's man's fault that all of this happened. God gave them everything they needed. They rejected it. Well, if you get to Genesis 6 and suddenly Moses starts saying, well, now it's the angel's fault, right? If you are a Jew who is writing in Old Testament times and you're in that's these theories about the angels, they all come from, from you know, uh, close to Jesus' time. Jews Greek, began writing Greek other mythology. other literature, kind of like Greek mythology, yeah. They began writing this other literature, and they're the ones that first said that Genesis, all the way up to that point in history, no one's even thought that before, and suddenly there's this new idea, angels. Well, right, that sounds nice, right? It's not my fault that we're in sin. It's the angels' fault. The fallen angels, they did this to us. Well, that sounds nice, but it's not what Moses is saying. Moses is saying there were righteous men, there were righteous people, and they married people who didn't care about God, and it led them astray. And that's what you see happen over and over again in the Old Testament. And so it's not the angel's fault. It's still humanity, which leads us all the way to Jesus in the book of Romans when he says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Humanity brought sin. Humanity persisted in sin. God destroyed the world in the flood because of that, and therefore we need Jesus to be human and to save us from those sins. And so it, it doesn't fit contextually both in Genesis or in the whole Bible. But there's one more thing, a third thing to consider from the evidence, and that is Mark chapter 12 and verse 25. And this one to me, I saved it for last because it's the most compelling, uh, and it's straight from the mouth of Jesus, and so it's really hard to argue with. But Mark chapter 12 and verse 25. I'm sorry, that's not the right spot. Let's see here. <coughs> it is? Oh, I'm in Matthew, that's why it doesn't look right. <laughs> right. They both start with Amiel. Mark chapter 12 
And in verse 25, Jesus is talking to the Sadducees. Now, if you remember, there were the Pharisees and there were the Sadducees. And the Pharisees uh, were very restricting, you know, don't do this, don't do that. And uh, the Sadducees had weird kind of like theological beliefs. They didn't believe in the afterlife, which is really bizarre. They didn't believe in angels and they didn't believe in that we have a spirit. They believe in God, but they don't believe we have a spirit. It's a very bizarre kind of belief. And so they're, they're discussing this with Jesus. And in verse 19, they ask the question, Teacher Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies and leave his wife behind, and leaves no children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. So here's a, here's a, when people give you hypotheticals, you don't always have to follow them down those hypotheticals because that's, that's, that can become a bunny trail that you'll never get out of and it just gets ridiculous. Jesus doesn't go down hypothetical with them. Verse 20, here's a hypothetical. There are seven brothers. The first man took a wife and he died and left no offspring. The second took her and he died and he did not leave any offspring. And the third, all the way down to the seventh, and they left no offspring. So all seven brothers married this woman. The first one died, and so she married his brother. All the way down to the seventh one, she had seven husbands and no children, no no heir. To If she had an heir, you would know who she belonged to. Right? If the third brother gave her an heir, she's the third brother's wife, or the seventh brother, or whatever. But she had no heir, so who does she belong to? In the next life, which right, they don't even believe there's a next life. They're trying to trick him. But in the next life, let's say that's true, who does she belong to? It's verse 20. In the resurrection, when they rise, whose wife will she be? They think this is proof that there's no resurrection. And so they ask this question. And Jesus answered and said, Are you not therefore mistaken? He really, they're supposed to be teachers of the law. So he really brings it down hard. Do you not know the scriptures? Do you not know the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. What do we know about angels based on what Jesus said? They can't marry. They don't have physical bodies. They can't do the things that married people do and create children. It, it's not possible. God didn't create them to be that way. Now, they take physical form at times, and you see that in the Old Testament. Angels will come and talk to people. But you, you know something? They, uh, they, they don't keep that physical form. They disappear because it's not, they, they're not people, and so they don't do the things that people do. They're, they're like God. God is spirit. Hebrews 2 talks about this, the nature of angels. Angels are spiritual beings. They don't have a body. If they don't have a body, but even the fallen ones can't have children with women. And so contextually, Genesis 6 can't be saying that the, uh, these are angel babies. And in the whole Bible, it doesn't make sense to say it's angel babies. That's just a false doctrine. Uh, I enjoy saying angel babies, I don't know about you. That's just a false doctrine that, uh, that the Jews made up so that they didn't feel so guilty about their sin, they could blame it on the angels. We don't wanna, we don't wanna be following a false doctrine like that. And, and Jesus says himself, angels don't marry, it's just not possible. And in the next life, we won't marry either. We'll be like them, we'll be spirit, not physical flesh. That doesn't mean our spouse won't be important to us anymore. It doesn't mean that we won't know each other. It just means that our relationship will not be one of a married couple who do the things that married couples do. Because we're not, our, our purpose is not to have children anymore or anything like that. Everyone who's going to be there is going to be there, and that will be all the people that are there. And we'll have a different purpose now, and so we won't need all of that anymore. And so he continues then, and he says in verse 30, But concerning the dead that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the burning bush passage, how God spoke to him, saying, I like that. He says, in the burning bush passage. We would say in Exodus 3, but they didn't have the chapter numbers yet. So he says, and we all know what he's talking about. In the burning bush, bush passage, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are therefore greatly mistaken. So it, it, all on the tense of a verb, I am the God of Abraham. If, he, if Abraham is dead, but God still is the God of Abraham, then in some sense, Abraham is alive, which means he has a spirit that will be resurrected one day. And so they feel like they've come up with this hypothetical scenario to prove that there's no afterlife, and they think that they're really going to trick Jesus. And he goes back and he says, you didn't read it close enough, did you? The tense of a verb, that's the detail of Bible study that Jesus wanted them to do. And Hebrews 2 says, do we not today give them more earnest heed? If he wanted it up to them, he wants us to do even more than that. 
And that's why I think these discussions and Genesis, like Genesis 6 and stuff are so, so, uh, so important because, you know, some people say, well, these things are not really that important. Sometimes arguments like the things we've been talking about are what break or make somebody's faith. It is important to some people. And so being prepared to talk about it is useful. And there's no level of Bible study that's unimportant because Jesus says down to the tense of a verb is important. And so there's, there's no level of Bible study that's, 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 that's too insignificant for us if it's not too insignificant for Jesus. And so when we, when we look that closely, we strengthen our own faith and we develop the ability to talk about it with other people to maybe help strengthen their faith. Any other thoughts or comments about the angels or, um, you know, and when I say angels, keep in mind we have one minute, so don't get too crazy with the angels. But any last thoughts or comments about angels or, or Genesis 6 or Mac, uh, Mark chapter 12 or anything like that? I think in Mark 12 it showed a good example of what Greek mythology had creeped in to, yes. uh, uh, to the uh, religion they had at the day because that's the same idea of the gods having relations with women yes. and then having the demigods, which oh, is yeah. like a Hercules or a, mm -hmm. uh, Achilles, those kind of, they weren't gods, but they had powers. Like gods. It's yeah. Like gods. Partial gods, kind right. of. Yeah. No, I, th I think it really is. There's a lot of similarities between the false theories about Genesis 6 and the Greek mythology <laughs> that, that you can read about. You know, Zeus uh, becoming a bull and having relations with a woman who then produces a son of some kind who has, and you hear me weird faces, these are real Greek stories, you can go read them for yourself. Yeah, yeah. Um, and having a son that has some kind of, he's human but he has God powers, kind of, that's, that's really not that different from Genesis 6. The way that people are thinking of Genesis 6, the false way, if you think about it, you can see where it came from, and you can see why it's really not false. Their story definitely makes you go off that direction when it comes to mythology, especially in the last of the words. Uh, in Genesis 6 of verse 4? Okay, yeah. Go ahead, Penny. The last of verse? Yeah, it says, so that those who are the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Yeah. You know, there's something special about them according to what that verse says. Yeah, they're, they're a special men, but it doesn't claim that they're anything more than than just men. Well, they are large yeah. and mighty, but... Yeah, sons of God taking their daughters as men. Mm -hmm. so yeah. People think differently than that. It's easy to block mm -hmm. that path. Yeah. Now, yeah, that's, you know, when it says sons of God, you think, uh, if these were fallen angels, they wouldn't call them of God. Right? Of God doesn't mean that they're spiritual beings only. It means they identified with God before they got married. And that's why he calls them the daughters of men. They identify more with the sins of humanity than they do with God. And so sometimes people say the sons of God must be angels. And same thing when you get to Job 1 and it says, you know, that the sons of God came before God. Well, it, it, he's been talking about Job coming before God to sacrifice to God. And he says, there came a day when the sons of God came before God. They came to worship that day. And Satan was there amidst them while they worshiped. And he and God have this sort of conversation, if you will, about the people who were worshiping that day. And he says, well, what about Job? And, you know, it's, of God doesn't mean angel. It means people who identify with God. So, all right, we will end there. Thank you so much for your comments and your attention this morning. And next week we'll be in Genesis chapter 8.